Well, thanks very much. Anyway, we're off and running. The um, situation that we want to talk about is mainly the surprise that everyone's had, not really knowing about Bradwell B. In the eastern region, uh, East Anglia, there are three licensed nuclear sites. In the top corner, there's Bradwell. Um, this is what it looks like now. You may wonder why the uh, reactor buildings and the other buildings are there, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, moving along, in 1966, another 40 years, of Sizewell, what is now called Sizewell A, and then underneath is Sizewell B. Now, Sizewell B is interesting because it is the same style of reactor. It is a pressurised water reactor that they propose for the three sites at the moment, Hinkley Point C, Sizewell C, and Bradwell B. A lot more powerful, that was just a single reactor um, with two turbine legs. Um, interestingly, it is just 45 miles as the crow flies from uh, Sizewell to Bradwell and then another 45 miles directly west to London from the Bradwell site. And interestingly, it is 55 miles to the next nearest uh, nuclear site, which is at Dungeness in Kent. I mentioned why are the buildings here? Well, this building was built around 2013, 2014. It is called an intermediate storage facility, and it is to house the intermediate level waste, that's ILW, from the decommissioning uh, of Bradwell. Essex County Council changed the planning restriction for only Bradwell's ILW waste to also receive waste from Dungeness and in the future it will receive waste from Sizewell A. Next to the reactor buildings there's this long building and that is a cover over the spent fuel store. Now what happened with that is they planned in the decommissioning they said oh it's not a problem it will be leveled but when they actually got up close and personal they found it was intensely radioactive so therefore they had to build another case over it which they rather erroneously call safe stores and then we have the two reactor buildings well within the reactor buildings is what they call the graphite cores which is part of the system to uh, stimulate the activity in a fission nuclear reactor and this is a cocktail of all the isotopes that um, have been left within the reactor building and it will take uh, 80 years until the graph this is a general summation graph of the dose rate to get down to roughly a level where humans can go in and decommission so what that means is that we're pretty much uh, if we allow 15 years um, for the final dismantling, then it takes us really realistically to the end of the century. They have never dismantled in full one of this type of reactors. So what are we looking at for the future? Well, there is size we'll see. Now the top picture, starting from the left, you've got size well A, then the one with the dome and the middle is size well B, and then the light colored one is the proposed size well C. And underneath, um, we have got the twin reactor proposal for Bradwell B. This is the way the site looks. This was taken from a drone in the distance, slightly to the right, you can see the reactor buildings that are clad, and this whole plot um, and the Denji, the tip of the northeast tip of the Denji Peninsula will be taken up with the building site and the site itself. This is how it looks from the air again and you can see in the foreground there the old Bradwell power station and you can make out the runways of the former RAF Bradwell Bay. And this is what they propose. It, it is an absolutely massive industrial complex and the things that are really surprising are these two cooling towers that are 500 feet wide and 200 feet high which will dwarf the former reactor buildings and and this is a, 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 a specification and it is really critical at this time that people respond to the consultation um, closing date uh, midnight on the 1st of July in a couple of weeks time. 
So it uses a Chinese reactor design. It's never been fired up anywhere in the world. There are some being built. Um, this would be the 15th. There's quite a few being built in China, Karachi, and um, one in Argentina. It has the two reactors, as I mentioned, um, totaling 2.3 uh, gigawatts each. So that is nearly, it's nine times, nearly 10 times the size of the former Bradwell, which we're now calling Bradwell A. There are huge impacts on the environmental designation, including the Ramsar site, and also on the marine ecology in the Blackwater estuary. And you can see, if I put the footprint of the former, um, or they call it the existing Bradwell power station, if we just look at that footprint, you can see how vast the new footprint is going to be and this is what the site would look like this is one from Hinkley Point C the building work there where it has completely devastated that area and the Ramsar site of the wetland site uh, of the northeast part of the Denji Peninsula is precious and will never be the same again. So this is a, a little uh, look at the cooling towers and you can see they've handily provided um, a picture underneath of, of what it would look like. But actually this is taken from the same point and in reality that's the sort of size that the cooling towers are going to look like on, on a view from uh, West Mersey. They will be seen from miles around because as I say they're taller than the existing buildings and they'll be on the plinth that is supposed to be there to um, prevent the ingress of tide. So safe, clean, reliable and works whatever the weather. This is the sort of guff that the nuclear industry puts out but we know that France suffered quite a lot from reactors having to shut down both last year and 2018 when the weather got hot and it uh, produces algae, the temperature differentiation of the water is not sufficient, so they have to shut them down. And now we're going to look at the, um, uh, the national policy statement. Remember that the old Bradwell station will, may have just been cleared away uh, in time, but this is the site where they are proposing the new Bradwell B will go in flood level two, flood level three. Environmentally, it's also in the marine conservation zone. And we can see this is a vast area. Directly south from West Mersey is the Bradwell site. This is another image of the two circles, 20 kilometer and 30 kilometer around the site for Bradwell B. Those of you will remember on Chernobyl that the 30 kilometre was the evacuation zone. This is another one of the fallacies that is put out. More nuclear power is needed to keep the lights on. Well, it is a bit of an irony that they had to shut down Sizewell B's second turbine leg during the really sunny and really windy weather. This is the simple solution for the energy trilemma. Reduction. That is more insulation, better insulation in houses, uses of LED bulbs, more efficient goods, uh, localization. Let's uh, have community energy projects and solar on people's roofs. And then we will also move to battery storage and larger storage systems such as pumped um, water storage. Another one claim is more nuclear power is needed for electrical car charging. Well, I can show you the figures on this. This again is incorrect. The top line in here is the government's prediction of the increase in demand for electricity and it, would, it was from 2011 to 2020. These are actual figures. It's the second graph which is sloping down and if we look up at the top here you can see that the actual decrease over this period of seven years was 17 and a half percent. By the time we get to the end of the year it's going to be a 32, 33 percent difference from what the government predicted. If we roll forward to the year 2030 and we make an assumption that half the number of cars on the road are electric cars and need to charge and the rest of the cars remain fossil fuel then this is the point at which you would see the increase in electricity. So 
it is nowhere near a nuclear power station. And if every car, well, we just move it up. The biggest point about this is that you no longer need the electricity to refine fuel for the fossil fuel cars that have come off the road. Nuclear power is the answer to reduce carbon dioxide levels. And this is somewhat bizarre because there have been a number of times when the carbon, and you can see here, the carbon uh, level is 103 grams equivalent of CO2 per kilowatt hour of generation. And that was at nine o'clock on the 6th of June. Uh, and as we go forward, uh, and the wind is increasing slightly and the solar comes up, and generally we have a pretty low carbon. The point about the figure below 100 is that's the target between 50 grams equivalent CO2 per kilowatt hour of generation to 100. That is the target parameter that the energy mix is trying to achieve for electricity. And, and here we can see the different uh, types of um, generation there, the colour-coded areas, and this is the carbon along the bottom. If we look at it right now, it's 267, so it's higher, it's not as good, and the gas, that's because the gas is up high, the nuclear is pretty much the same, solar 3.1, but wind is, is very low. And it's that variability that an energy mix, an electrical energy mix, needs to match, not with something constant, it needs to have something variable. And at the moment, the problem is that is natural gas, which is the, is the one on the top left, and the electricity is the 18.1 in the bottom left-hand corner. And we have a problem because natural gas is a fossil fuel. Ecotricity, for example, proposes using green gas. Now, green gas is uh, from grass uh, using anaerobic digestion, and they can remove the CO2 and then there's a biomethane that can go directly into the uh, national gas grid. Now, ecotricity reckon about 97% of domestic gas could be converted to green gas by 2035. Even the national grid, and that's the little bit on the bottom here, suggests 50% that renewable gas could meet the UK residential gas demand. What I mentioned about the petroleum fuel, that would shrink, but of course we still have air travel, which is using a lot of petroleum products. And here we can see what the zero carbon Britain, I do recommend looking at cat.org.uk. This is the breakdown where they're trying to reduce the amount of carbon on transport and industry and massively reduce the buildings by insulation and appliances. Let's talk about the elephant in the room and that is the radioactive waste. We're going to look at this quote that was on BBC Radio 4 in 2015 by Phil Hallington, the Head of Operations and Development at Sellafield, which is the main nuclear waste processing plant. He said that if you placed a teacup sized piece of high level waste derived from spent nuclear fuel in the middle of a football pitch, you and everyone in the stadium would be dead before you left the centre circle. That's how toxic radioactive waste is. And that's what they want to have on the coastline at Sizewell and Bradwell for 100 years or more. Super nasty waste that comes from the new design of nuclear reactors. What can we do? What can you do to stop this uh, taking over? Well, um, really it's about joining a group such as the Japanese Against Nuclear Group, BANG, BAN, it doesn't matter if you join more than one group. You can sign petitions and support campaigns. It's far more important to support than just sign. The two things go hand in hand. You can re respond to the consultation, that needs to be done right now. You can write to the developers, EDF and Chinese General Nuclear. You can write to your local councillors, your local MP. You can contribute to legal challenge costs. Both Sizewell and uh, Bradwell groups will be challenging and you can keep spreading the news. So that's me. Thank you for bearing with me.